we will get somewhat of a running start tonight in Isaiah 62 because the last two verses in Isaiah 61, if you recall, uh, we, I was hinting at some things and didn't get to cover some of those verses about what seemed to change the perspective of that chapter to look like a wedding or a marriage. In fact, the, the words bridegroom and bride show up in Isaiah 61 verse 10 as apparently the bride here or the city, the people in the city of Israel and Jerusalem, are rejoicing in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels, as the earth brings forth her bud, and the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations." And uh, so we see, we see the marriage terms there in verse 10. And if you go back and recall that, that whole chapter was speaking to different audiences. At first it was Jesus or the bridegroom, the Messiah, speaking about himself. The Spirit of the Lord has come upon me. And then he starts speaking to Israel, saying, I'm going to make you the priests of the Lord. And they'll call you the priests of the Lord. And then he starts talking to the Gentile nations, saying what he's going to do to Israel. Right, so he talks to the nation, says, I'm going to give them their land back, talking about Israel. And then in the last portion here, you see Israel themselves, apparently, the city itself, rejoicing <laughs> and talking about, I've been adorned like a bride and a bridegroom, like a wedding ceremony, right? So it's kind of interesting there. You see, you see the bridegroom, and then you, you see there's priests involved, but there's, he's talking to the bride, and then there's these witnesses, the Gentile witnesses of this thing. They're going to see Israel's glory. And then you see the rejoicing of the bride at the end. The bride of the Messiah, the bride of Christ, which is not a term in your Bible, but the idea is there, uh, is always going to be this city. It's always going to be God's covenanted people, Israel. And so what we see at the end of Isaiah 61 is, uh, is what is talk, it, it talks about the time of this wedding ceremony and marriage. Look at Revelation 19, verse 7. <clears throat> We've already seen in Isaiah how the Lord says He is the maker of Israel, and He is their husband. Revelation 19 reveals to you a time of when this marriage occurs. 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. This is what's going on in Isaiah 61 verse 10. The rejoicing, right? For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Isaiah 61 verse 10. They're rejoicing and singing, and they're adorned like the bride or the bride in the bridegroom, right? So, uh, Revelation 19:7. Verse 8, to her, that's the, the wife, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. So there's the clothing and the garments of Isaiah 61. Clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We'll see that again tonight. So the bride was adorned there uh, with jewels, which has to do with his righteousness apparently. With righteousness. In verse 9, he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now there's a big to do about whether or not you're going to be the bride here or one's attending the marriage supper. People miss the, the point entirely. Okay? Uh, the people who, or what God is married to is the city and the land. That's the covenant he has. And those who attend the marriage supper, those who, who see God reunited, Christ the Lord reunited with his covenanted people in his land, uh, are going to be these Gentiles. And the issue is whether or not they are able to attend or not. Right. So if they're not going to be able to rejoice with Israel, they're going to be slaughtered. If they rejoice with Israel that God has kept their, His promise to you, then they will be in the kingdom. Right. So this is going to be this difference here. And thus Jesus Himself gives parables and, and tellings about the marriage and who gets invited based on their response to Him in, in Jerusalem. In verse, verse 10, these are the true sayings of God. I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, which we've seen many times through Isaiah, Jesus himself speaking. This, this is saying here that the prophets, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So who, who's telling these things to the prophets? Well, God is. But Jesus is God. Right? So there's many times where Jesus himself is speaking words in Isaiah, and then he comes in Matthew, Matthew, and John and says the things that he already said to Isaiah. And here in Revelation 19, it's the same thing. 
He sees heaven open in verse 11. There's a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth, make, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Remember that crowns. We'll see again in Isaiah 62, the crown of the Lord that he wears here. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Tonight's chapter will be about a new name given to the bride and bridegroom there. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Of course, we know that to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses and clothed them in fine linen and white and clean. And so, let's go back to <clears throat> Song of Solomon. And if you want to put a finger, a bookmark, or a piece of paper there in Song of Solomon, you, you would do good tonight. <clears throat> We're going to try to see Song of Solomon throughout tonight's chapter. Now, I've got some 20 different commentaries of Isaiah sitting next to me uh, when I'm studying through them. I don't always use all of them, but um, regarding this chapter, I consulted them to see if I can't find them make reference to the Song of Solomon. And uh, behold, I could not find any do that. And so, me doing this, making a connection to Song of Solomon, is, um, is not something I found in a commentary. I don't say that to boast. But just that to say, you make your own mind up. But I see a very significant connection to Song of Solomon, yeah. the love poem in the Bible, a unique genre, and the subject of Isaiah 62, which is this marriage of the Lord to his city. Okay? And we'll actually see a verse that pretty much sums up the Song of Solomon. In case you want to know a good summary in the Bible, Isaiah 62, verse 4 and 5, pretty much sum that up pretty good. We'll get to that here in a moment. Song, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. This love poem has been so sensualized and corrupted the last hundred years that people have missed, in combination with a lack of right division and dispensational understanding, they have totally missed the point of this thing. Okay? They make it a, about a husband and a wife and marriage nights and things like this. Well, it is about a man and a woman, and it is about their love for each other, but there's more description in this book about land than there are body parts, and we'll get to that in a bit. But notice in verse 15, in verse chapter 4 here, it says, A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Didn't Jesus talk about living water? He did. You ask me, I'll give you water, and you'll never die, you never thirst again, right? He says, from the north and the south, there's a garden. There's spices that are going to come out of this garden. There's fruits from this garden. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Ver chapter 5, verse 1. I am coming to my garden, says the, the bridegroom, says the, 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 the man here. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends. Drink ye. Drink abundantly, O beloved. That's a good time, obviously. Right? Fruit is being born. And there's love being expressed between this bridegroom and bride. When Isaiah 61 verse 11 says, As the earth brings forth her bud, and as the garden causes things that are sown in it to spring forth, that's Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and chapter 5 there. As a garden springs forth with fruits and with the things that come out of gardens, right? Isaiah 61 verse 11 says, as a garden causes things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth from Zion before all nations, right? Isaiah 61 11 is interpreting for you Song of Solomon, right? So if you don't make that connection, you just think, well, that's a weird love, erotic love poem there. We should take that out of our Bible. You know, don't read that to kids. Well, Isaiah 61 verse 11 says, that's talking about the Lord causing righteousness and praise to bring forth before all nations out of the city that he's married to. Hmm? So there's the interpretation. Isaiah 61 verse 3. Remember back, I'm moving backwards now. So Isaiah 61 verse 3. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him, Jesus Christ the Messiah, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them unto them beauty for ashes. Song of Solomon uses a word for beauty called fair. Fair means beautiful. Same, same, same word, right? And he uses that word fair or beauty more times than any other book of the Bible. It's interesting. Okay, the summary of that love poem is the beauty of the beloved. Or, based on the interpretation of Isaiah 61, the beauty of the city of God. 
right? The beauty of his land and, and the people that he created for his purpose, right? Isaiah 61 verse 3 says, I give to them that mourn in Zion beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, mourning the garment of praise, the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. What happens when you plant something? You want it to bear fruit. Song of Solomon is the love poem out for, uh, rejoicing in the fruit that is born out of the planting of the Lord. Right? The bride says, Come to the garden and look at the trees in the garden. The bridegroom says, that's exactly what I wanted. Fruit from the garden. Amen. Right? We see this in Isaiah 5 and other places. Okay. So the planting of the Lord is bearing fruit in the kingdom. In the Bible, when marriage occurs between a man and a woman, <clears throat> a new name happens. And this has been a tradition there's not a, a verse that gives a commandment, of course, but you see this as a tradition throughout the scripture that a new name is given when uh, to become one. In the beginning, it starts in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where God created man in his own image. And that verse in Genesis 1, 27 isn't just referring to the male. He created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So he calls them man. Right? Which, if you've heard Adam taught before, you know Adam is the same word for man here in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. Right? It's, it's man. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 is an exposition or an expounding of that verse because in the sixth day he creates man, male and female. Genesis 2 is not a contradictory account of creation, it's an expansion of the sixth day where he, he describes how he created woman. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. That's why the word woman is the way it is, because she was taken out of man in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Eve doesn't get her name until after she sins. <clears throat> it was a woman and a man. Right? He called him her woman because she was taken out from him. Genesis 3, verse 20. Adam called his wife's name Eve. Why? Because after the sin there they made babies and says, because she was the mother of all living. In Genesis chapter 5, it says in verse 2, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created, Genesis 127. And so the two are one, sharing a name. And so the idea that we are now a new family, it's the only arrangement and it's a beautiful arrangement, the only arrangement where two people who are not related by blood become one as if by blood, right? Even when you're married, the people who begat the people you're married to, you call in-laws, right? Because it's only by law. But the person you're married to becomes almost even closer to those who are by blood. Like, the two become one. This is the only relationship in the world that's like this. Right? Because otherwise it's brothers and sisters by blood, and fathers and mothers and sons by blood, right? But the person you're married to is not your blood, but they become like that. Even your sons and daughters are your blood, but your spouse is not. And God creates marriage to make them one, and thus they take the same name. It's one new family that's created. I say all this as a, a marriage teaching just because in Isaiah 62 it's talking about this marriage between God and Israel, between the Lord and His city. And in the context of this, uh, he's giving them a new name. Isaiah 62, verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp. See the righteousness again? He wants to plant them as trees of righteousness. The righteous goes forth. Isaiah 61 says, the garden will bear fruit when righteousness goes forth out of this city. It's all about the righteousness being seen. And the speaker here, this Lord, this Messiah, the bridegroom is saying, I will not rest until this happens. I have promised it will happen, and it will happen. Similarly, when you get engaged to marry someone, the passion of love to say, I will not rest until we are married. That's what engagement is, right? Engagement is not like, let's get married, and then you forget about it. Like, what is that? Not engagement. But here, the promise is, I will not hold my peace 
for Jerusalem's sake. Jerusalem is the bride. Look at Revelation 20 and 21. Jerusalem is the one God made a covenant with. I will not rest until the righteousness of Jerusalem goes forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. You see what, what's happening here? This is an expression of the bridegroom and his promise to his bride that it will occur. Right? So he will not rest. This is the zeal of the Lord. Isaiah 9, verse 7 speaks about the zeal of the Lord back there where unto us a, a son is uh, given. Remember that? It's a shame people only think of this verse during uh, one season of the year because it speaks about a, a time of eternal presence with Jesus in Israel. Isaiah 9, verse 7, of, of verse 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. He says, I will not rest till there be peace and righteousness, right? And there'll be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is the same attitude people have towards marriage when they get married. It's like, we will love each other. And you want to say forever, but in the Christian tradition, you always sail till death do us part, right? And what's to deal with that? The Mormons talk about celestial marriage. They talk about getting married forever and having spirit babies in heaven. Not biblical. But you, the love that people possess, you want to say forever. We write songs about it. I love you forever. And you, you will love them forever. If they're in Christ, that's, that's true. Right? But the marriage vow is always till death do us part. Because there's the union you have in Christ that's even closer than your marriage union. Right? That you'll have forever. Um, but till death do us part is what nullifies the earthly marriage arrangement. Because your genealogy on earth doesn't matter as much when you're in heaven at all, really. So Isaiah 9, though, it says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He'll perform what was just said, the increase and in abundance of the government of, of, of Jerusalem, okay, through this son that is given. That son's the Messiah. He's going to be the bridegroom. Romans 15, 8, Jesus came as a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. We talk about those promises being a land and the seed and the blessing, but in the context of tonight's lesson, the promise is of a Jesus returning into a kingdom. And we've seen this kingdom personified or, or rather described in many different ways. And in this chapter, we see it described as a marriage. Right? And so there was a promise way back here of marriage, right, given to the fathers, right? When Jesus came, he came to confirm the promise made to the fathers. Isaiah 2 is describing as a Song of Solomon that when it happens, right? The rejoicing that will happen between the bride and the bridegroom. And so... The remnant of Israel, look at Zephaniah. See, Zeph what? Zephaniah. It's a book in your Bible, three chapters. You go to Matthew, you turn left a little bit, you'll get there. It's just before Malachi and Zechariah and Haggai. Zephaniah chapter 3. If you, don't, if you don't find it, I'll read it to you. Zephaniah 3, verse 13. <clears throat> we talk about the remnant of Israel a lot in our dispensational studies, and this is a good verse uh, among many others in Isaiah. To show you, this is not just a phrase that we make up. This is a biblical term describing those in Israel that do believe God and how he fulfills these promises. Zephaniah 3, verse 13, The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies. Now, Zephaniah is speaking about this future hope for remnant of Israel, the salvation of this nation. And he says, At this time, the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity. They won't sin nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. This is different than anything in Israel's past, obviously. This is them purified and cleansed. This is them prepared in the language of Isaiah 62 to have that marriage to the Lord. Remember what Revelation 19 says? They were clothed with fine linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. These remnant, this remnant of Israel is righteous, right? That's what it's saying. They're clothed in fine linen. They're ready for this. Okay, that's what that's saying. And so, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. We saw this in Isaiah 61. I rejoice to the Lord. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. There's no more punishment of you. 
Right? So you see where we're at here? We're in the kingdom. There's judgments here. There's been judgments throughout Israel's history. But here, no more. He hath cast out thine enemy, the king of Israel, even the Lord is in the midst of thee. There again, another evidence of where we're at. Here the Lord has come down to earth, and he's dwelling there with them. Okay? Thou shalt not see evil anymore. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, deliver us from evil. That's just not just like, well, evil's going to happen forever, you know, so just deliver me from it. Yeah, there's going to be evil here in the tribulation, and they're going to pray to be delivered from it, but this is the deliverance. Amen. The prayer is for the kingdom come. That's when evil is delivered from them. Thou shalt not see evil anymore. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. Now who is this speaking to here? Jerusalem and Zion. Does it say the church, the body of Christ? No. Does it say Gentiles even? No. Verse 17, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. Notice God's response to this city. Joy and rejoicing. Like he's pleased by them, by it. Right? He will rest in his love. That's interesting terminology. So the Lord is in the midst of them. God will rest in his love when this occurs. See, you see how this is, this is using marriage language here? It's like, that's what happens when you, you get engaged. It's like a promise that I love you and we will be united. And then when that happens, you rest in your love. That's what marriage is, right? And he says, he will rest in his love and he will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they are put to shame. So he'll gather them out from all nations, right? At that time will I bring you again, even in that time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth, when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. So he's going to bring them back and give them a name of praise and fame. See, see fame there? Praise and fame? Okay. He is going to uh, give them a name that is famous. The world will want to go to them, just like the rich and famous today, people lust after. When Zion is the rich and the famous, we've already talked about the rich before, when they get this new name, the world will go to them. Right? And so we've drawn this so many times, in so many contexts, it's, it's, it should be getting old, right? Hopefully after Isaiah you realize why we, we talk about the nations going to Israel, because it's like, that's the promise, that's the marriage, that's the feast, that's the, the rest, that's, that's what that is. All that language, all those metaphors speak about that. Right? What's not spoken about is the body of Christ. Moving on. Go back to Isaiah 62, verse 2. 62 verse 2, the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. Don't skip over some of these words that make these prophecies distinct. It doesn't say the Gentiles shall have righteousness, so the Gentiles will be given righteousness. The Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. Do Gentiles get righteousness today? Yeah. You're imputed righteousness by faith through Jesus Christ. Amen. This says the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. Their righteousness won't be just something imputed to them spiritually. It will be something manifestly evident. It will be, in other words, as theologians and, and Bible students have said in the past, a visible kingdom. Because it will be a visible righteousness. That's not true about the church. The church isn't visible. We look just like everybody else. Though we have righteousness by faith. And that's not talking about our behavior. It's talking about Christ, right? This is visible. The Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and kings of the earth thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. So I want to spend a little bit of time in the next few verses on this name. As we saw in Zephaniah 3, there's going to be a new name given to it, a name of praise and a name of fame, right? A new name. Many names are given to this city, as we've studied in Isaiah already. Isaiah 45, verse 23, gives a couple. Isaiah 45, verse 23, I have sworn by myself... The word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength, even to him shall men come. So Christ is going to be here. 
And he's the one that every knee shall bow to. Right? And people are going to say, they're going to go to Jerusalem because they're going to say in verse uh, 24, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Going to Jerusalem because in the Lord he has, they have righteousness. All right. Go over to Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33. What is this name, this new name that the, that the bride is going to be given? The new name is not the church, the body of Christ. The new name is not the church or what have you. That's not what it is. Jeremiah 33, verse 7. I will cause the captivity of Judah and Israel to return. I will build them as the first. Do you see that, that terminology there? It's repeated so many times in the prophets. And one of the reasons for that is to give you context. When that happens, and you put all these other pieces together, right? When he returns from captivity back to their land, the idea of their returning to a land is so contradictory to the body of Christ. We're not returning to any land, okay? Verse 8, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity. We saw that in Zephaniah whereby they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities where they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. That's Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. It shall be to me a name of joy, a name of praise, a name of honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. You see, the nations will see and hear the good that he does to one nation, and they will come and want to see. That's what's going to go on. And for all the goodness and prosperity that I procure unto it, God is going to procure unto it, which is, Add it to the, the reasons of why is, Israel today is not fulfilling this. Okay, first of all, the nations aren't running to them saying, look at all the riches, let's, let's go see what that is. What a wonder that is. But secondly, even if that were the case, in, in some instances people try to make it that way, right? That there's, there's so many poor countries around them, but they're the wealthiest in the area and that sort of business. But the, God didn't give it to them. And the nations didn't give it to them. It says here, I will procure prosperity for them. In verse 10, thus saith the Lord, again, there shall be heard in this place, which ye, which ye say shall be desolate without man, without beast. You say the city will be desolate, will be empty. But it says in verse 11, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. You see the context we're in here. The voice of them that shall say, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord, for I will cause them to return to the land. Verse 12, thus saith the Lord of hosts, again in this place which is desolate without man, without beast, and all the cities thereof, shall be habitants of shepherds, causing their flocks to lie down. Okay. Let's jump down to verse 14. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. That's Jesus. And he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she, Jerusalem, shall be called. The Lord, our righteousness. You see, they're going to come to Jesus because saying he's our righteousness. But where is Jesus? In the city. So they're coming to the city and they're calling the city the Lord, our righteousness, because that's where the Lord, our righteousness is. Right? That's the name of the city. So Isaiah 62 cannot be fulfilled until the Lord, our righteousness is there. Amen. Right? That Lord, our righteousness, by the way, that, that terminology... It's one of many compound Jehovah names in your Bible. Some of you have done that study, some of you have not. But there are different Jehovah, which means Lord, and translated Lord in your Bible, with a compound to it, like the Lord, our righteousness, or the Lord, our shepherd, or the Lord, our help, or the Lord. There's a whole list of these compound names. You heard of Jehovah Jireh, which is, is maintained in the King James Bible that way. Right? There's, there's these different compound names, and, um, and, and that's given. So um, the Lord who provides what Jehovah Jireh is. And that's what this Lord our righteousness is. This is the name of the city. Okay. Look at Jeremiah 23, verse 5. We see it back here again. This branch. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. That's Jesus, the Messiah, son of David. 
and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. This is not the church of the body of Christ. We don't have no king on earth. Like we're not a kingdom on the earth here. We have Jesus. You call him the king, but he's not reigning and prospering on the earth. Unless you spiritualize that, making prospering people spiritually with all blessings. But that's in heavenly places, Ephesians 1 verse 3. So you can't make them fit. This is Israel. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. <laughs> That's not happening in 2021. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called Lord our righteousness. You see that? Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, but the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north, and the south, and the east, and the west, right? And from all countries, whether I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Remember the Song of Solomon, chapter 4? O north wind, O south wind, and fruit being born from the garden. Those four winds are bringing back Israel. And there's fruit coming in that kingdom. That's what's going on there. So, you see this new name mentioned a few times. Look at Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 26. Early on in the book of Isaiah, God told Isaiah what he would call this, this city. Isaiah 1, verse 26, I will restore thy judges at the first, and thy counselors as the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Isaiah 1, verse 26. So this bride in Isaiah 62 cannot be you and me, because you are not a city. I am not a city. The church is not a city. But this bride will be the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion, identified in verse 27 here shall be redeemed with judgment, and her converts with righteousness. Isaiah 1. Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 15. I'll read this to you here real quick. All that passed by. Now, Lamentations is written when Jerusalem was destroyed. Not a city of righteousness. But he says, All that passed by clapped their hands at thee. They hiss and wag their head at the dot of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city that men called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? Not in Lamentations. So they're mocking it, right? Is this supposed to be the city of righteousness? The, the perfection of beauty? What's Song of Solomon about? The beauty of the beloved. It's when that city is the beauty of the earth. And so that love poem makes sense. Because it's talking about how beautiful she is, and she's talking about how beautiful he is, and it's like this beauty and this love. And that will be what the world sees. Her beauty, right? And so Lamentations 2.15 talks about the perfection of beauty. Psalm 48 verse 2 talks about the beauty of the city. A lot of the Psalms deal with this. Psalm 48 verse 2, beautiful for situation. He says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. But you see, Psalms are prophesying about this great city, this beautiful city. Isaiah 62, verse 3. So why would God praise a city so much? We live in a world that's run by politics, you understand. Nations and governments, cities, places, right? We get hope in that our hope is not in these fallible, unrighteous, corruptible cities on this planet. Our hope's in the Lord who is not here, and he's going to take us away into glory. And there's a hope in that. Because if our hope is in these corruptible cities, we've got a problem. But God's purpose is not to, to ignore the earth. His purpose is not to forget what He created or the promises He made. He will make this world beautiful, and that is going to be through the city that He establishes. That's why it's beautiful, right? There's patriotism in America because of uh, liberty and freedom that we've had and different things like that. And there's beautiful songs written. America the Beautiful being one, right? Talking about the beauty of a land that gives people justice and righteousness and peace and freedom, right? And sometimes, especially nowadays perhaps, you sing some of those songs going, that doesn't seem to ring true, <laughs> right? But there'll be a city where songs like that do ring true about forever, right? And this is this idea, yeah. thus the love poem in Song of Solomon, thus Isaiah 62 in this marriage ceremony. Isaiah 62 verse 3, thou shalt also, thou being this city, right, being the, uh, the bride here, Thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of God. So, a diadem is like a tiara or a crown. So, you know, it's like a, a crown on the head of God, right? 
So when you look at a mountain, it's interesting, you look at a city on a hill, you kind of see it kind of like that, kind of on the top of a hill. Uh, but it says here that it, the, the, the city will be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of God. In Zechariah chapter 9, it talks about this specifically. Zechariah 9 verse 6 says, well, not 9 verse 6, 16. The Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful and new wine the maids. That's a party, right? There's beauty there. There's cheerfulness and joy and new wine and everything else. And there's this crown of glory, the stones. You dress brides up at weddings. Why is that? They, they, get, they really get fancied up. It's a good day. It's an expression of love. It's bringing people together. It's the beauty of the bride and the love of the bridegroom, and that's what marriage is. Like, where's that come from? Our traditions, though a lot of them get corrupted, have come from ideas from the Scripture like this. Okay? And so, you see the crown of glory there. Now, Isaiah 62, verse 4. If you want the summary of a Song of Solomon, Isaiah 62, verse 4 and 5, 3, 4, and 5 here deal with this Song of Solomon idea. Verse 4, Thou, the city, shall no more be termed forsaken, uh, neither shall thy land any more be desolate. So you had it called forsaken. Forsaken is what Jerusalem looks like pretty much through history, There's, with few exceptions, right? And desolate is what it looks like when they're not in the land anymore and when it's destroyed. And that, again, has been repeated throughout history. There's no city on earth that has been destroyed and then rebuilt as many times as Jerusalem. It's like the opposite of beauty, right? You have an old car or something that you constantly have to fix up to make it run. It's like, yeah, he's still kicking, <laughs> right? But it's not like that brand new car. So what a day when it is a new city, brand new. Like, Jerusalem's been around for a while. This city's going to come out from heaven, right? This is going to be a city built by God, a new name given even. They're going to be renewed in that way. And so, you see in Isaiah 62, verse 4, Forsaken is the term, or the name given to the city. Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hebzibah. Hebzibah is the name of Hezekiah's wife, which is interesting. Remember all those prophecies that Isaiah gave by Hezekiah? And you, we, we were kind of talking about whether it was Hezekiah he was talking about or Jesus. <laughs> which one was that? Some of them, Hezekiah was a type of Jesus, type of the Messiah. Hebzibah is his wife. That's interesting. He's calling the land, the city, Hebzibah, which is the name of the wife of the man who was the type of Jesus. Jesus is married to the land. Do you get it? I mean, we said it over and over again. That's what's happening here. Hezbollah is Hezekiah's wife. It has meaning, though. People used to name, their, name people for a reason. Names have become random and meaningless, just like people's theology nowadays. But when God made man, he called him Adam, because Adam means man. When man called her woman, that was because he came from him. That's what woman means. When he called her Eve, it meant the mother of all living. There was meaning to names, right? People don't think about that much anymore, but Isaiah 62, verse 4 there's names given to the city, forsaken and desolate is what they, they were called. Lamentations is a desolation of the city. Is this what they call the city of beauty? That doesn't look like the perfection of beauty. It looks more like desolate and forsaken to me. Right? But they'll be called Hezebah, and in thy land, Beulah. And there it is, Beulah land. There's the hymn that C. Austin Miles wrote in 1911, who also wrote the song, not uncoincidentally, In the Garden. Frequently, the most popular Christian hymn, In the Garden. And we've changed the words entirely to that to I come to the Bible alone, right? Instead of walking in the garden and talks with me and walks with me in the garden. So a beautiful song, right? But the in the garden, didn't we read about that in Song of Solomon? Yeah. What a beautiful love letter. Song of Solomon is a beautiful love letter, right? And in the garden, the people want to sing that. But if you know Song of Solomon, it's talking about Israel and the city and the bride and the bridegroom there. It's like, well, that's not us. Neither is the Garden of Eden. Okay. But meanwhile, he wrote in the garden, he also wrote Dwelling in Beulah Land, which we've also changed the words to, to By Grace I Stand. But he talks about, I'm living on a mountain in the chorus, underneath a cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. 
I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply. I'm dwelling in Beulah land. He's seeing it as if he is right now. And so the verses in the song are, things around me look terrible, which they do in this present evil world. But he says, I'm dwelling in Beulah land. Like he takes himself there in his mind, right? As, because his theology was that we're living in the kingdom now. But how can it be if the world's filled with strife and filled with sorrow and everything else, right? Well, that's because in my mind and my heart, there's peace and calm. Well, that's beautiful sounding. But the prophecies that talk about Beulah land talk about a real time of glory on the earth. Okay? So the doctrine's wrong. The only time in the Bible it mentions Beulah is Isaiah 62, verse 4. So there's no confusing this. He took Beulah from Isaiah 62, verse 4, which is talking about Jesus, the Messiah, marrying the land of Israel, Jerusalem, the city the fulfillment of his promise to them, right? And he thought he was living in it in 1911. See, that, that, that's an issue doctrinally, okay? You see, it gave him comfort. What's wrong with that? A lot of things can give you comfort. Lies can give you comfort, right? God is a God of all comfort. doesn't mean that any comfort is right, right? There's true comfort, and then there's just things that aren't real. He talks about endless manna, right? God promises Israel that. The feast that they'll have there, the joy that'll be on the earth there, what a day that will be. But he says, he'll call the land Beulah. Now, Hezebah and Beulah, I said names have meaning, and you're going to go, well, these are Hebrew-sounding names. I don't know. I need to find a Jew to tell me what this means. Maybe you should go to seminary to learn some Hebrew to know what these names mean. But no, you don't have to do that. Because when the Bible wants to tell you what the Hebrew words mean, it tells you, like it does in this verse. He says, Thou shalt be called Hezebah and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, which is the meaning of the name Hezebah. You are my delight, you are my beloved, I delight myself in thee. And thy land shall be Beulah, married. Beulah means married, the married one. You're married, right? So you won't be forsaken anymore. You won't be desolate. You'll be Beulah. You won't be forsaken and desolate. You'll be the delight of the Lord. Okay? You'll be the beautiful, beloved, married of the Lord. That's Song of Solomon, folks. Read the Song of Solomon. It's talking about the love poem between the bride and the bridegroom, the Lord and his city, the, 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 represented there by the man and the woman. Right? And so you, you see there the, the name change. The Lord's marriage then fulfills these land covenants. Not too much more to say about that, except for that Beulah land is not a song we should sing today. It's a song that, that Israel will hope for and the prophets speak about, but it's not happening on the earth yet. Verse 5, For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Verse 4 and 5 is Song of Solomon. That's what it is. As the young man marries a virgin. Like, what does that mean? Like, in love? Yeah, Song of Solomon. Or as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, like Song of Solomon does? Yeah, that's what that is. So that's the summary right here. Isaiah 62 is explaining for you the meaning of Song of Solomon. For more details, read Song of Solomon, right, about what this love is like. And you read that, and you can't help but read it and say, what a love this is. It's a beautiful love poem, right? These verses in verses 5 through 9, which we'll see here, detail this engagement between the Lord and the bridegroom and the bride. Okay? Look at Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Chapter 8. The very end of the book is a summary of, uh, of the whole book itself. And it's Song of Solomon 8, verse 6. <clears throat> Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For, the, for love is strong as death. Isn't that great? Love is strong as death. Because, and isn't that a, a reoccurring theme? I think of Romeo and Juliet, right? Like, love is as strong as death. And so this idea that death is a, a power against humanity, but our love is stronger than that. Right? People die for other people because of love. Well, man, the preaching from this, it's a great love poem. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. This is talking about love. 
right? The coals of love and the fire of love. Verse 7, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. It's saying that he'd give everything you own, right? It sounds like modern lyrics to a love song, right? No water can quench my love. I mean, that's right out of the 1970s. <laughs> Come on. But th this is the summary of the book there. It's just love for the bride uh, from the bridegroom. Song of Solomon is a reminder of the Lord's love for his people, his land, the city. Okay? It's read by tradition on the eighth day of the Passover by the Jews. Why would they read Song of Solomon every eighth day on the Passover? Because it reminds them of the love of the Lord for his people. That's what they understand, right? It really takes a lack of understanding of the Scripture and a fleshly orientation to think this is some sort of marital instruction book, which is what it's been turned into in the 20th century. Okay. I told you already the word beauty, which is the word fair in Song of Solomon, they mean the same thing, is used more times in that book than any other book of the Bible. Okay. The word love is showed up in that book more than any other book of the Bible, 50, 54 times, 28 times in the form of beloved. Right? The city of Jerusalem is mentioned eight times. Solomon, the name, like King Solomon, is mentioned seven times. And I say that because that's significant. There's only eight chapters in the book. So an average once per chapter, Jerusalem comes up. And more frequently than that are descriptions of the land of Jerusalem from rivers and trees and fruits and jewels and stones and lands and mountains all over the place. So yes, but they're used to describe a woman or the man. Well, yes, but it's describing the land. Read it. You would, if using the analogies, you're going, that must be a really beautiful land. And that's the point, right? It talks about the fruits in the land of Israel. It talks about the trees in the land of Israel. It talks about the rivers in the land of Israel. In fact, Eden comes up a few times because Eden is in the promised land. Eden comes up and it's like, this is like, we're living in Eden. I mean, a, a time without sin, it's just love, right? Eden gets restored here, right? The Song of Solomon is this restoration of all that, the love and the peace and the, the you don't say innocence, but the lack of sin there, the, the righteousness is on display there, right? And so you see that. It describes all of that more than it does human anatomy. Okay, so it's, it's really your imagination that does things with that. And it's not that it, there, there's not connections, obviously. It's a man and a woman, but it's talking more about the land, quite literally. Isaiah 62, verse 6, this engagement that the bridegroom has here, he says, as a young man marries the virgin, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee, Zion. I have set watchmen upon my walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace, nor night, day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. So these watchmen, which would typically be guards of the city, right? These watchmen here are, are simply watching over the fulfilling of this. So the promise is of the coming of the bridegroom. Remember Song of Solomon? Maybe you don't. You haven't read in a while. Song of Solomon multiple times. It's like, where's my bridegroom? Right? Like she's looking for him. He hasn't come yet. Right? And so he's saying, I've set watchmen to look for my coming. And of course, the watchmen and the prophets that speak about these prophets, the prophets are watchmen, right? Looking for the fulfillment of what God said would happen, what he said would come. And when he finds people not watching for what he said should come, they're blind, right? Jesus comes in his earthly ministry and he says, watch, for you know not the hour. Remember that? He said, have watchmen, watch, for you know not know the hour. What are they looking for? His return. Amen. The kingdom come. Watch, I'll give you signs of my coming. Song of Solomon, where is he at? You know, is he going to come? Yeah, he's going to. Then he starts talking. They start thinking about the bride, the bride and Song of Solomon starts thinking about what he looks like and what's he going to do and what's it going to be like when they get married, right? Yeah, watch for that. Set your focus on that kingdom. That's what he's saying. So the watchmen are supposed to see it, and that means the bride is supposed to make herself ready. If the bridegroom comes and the bride's not ready, what happens? Uh, well, there's not a wedding going on there. Yeah, yeah, well, it won't be, right. But that's the idea. It's like, what happened? I thought I was coming for you. Well, you know, I didn't know you'd come. I promised. And then I told you, prophecy, prophecy, when, right? And so the watchmen are set up in verse 6. They're watching day and night. So this is an encouragement for Israel to read these prophecies, to know when it's going to happen. When Jesus comes and explains when, 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 that's why. And this is also why in this dispensation, he doesn't tell us when. Okay? 
He tells them when. It's all about timing because there's a marriage on the books, folks. It's going to happen. It's got to happen. If it doesn't happen, well, when is it going to happen? Well, he tells them when. We're not waiting to get married to the Lord. First, we're not a city. We are members of his body. It has already happened for us. Right? We are not waiting for something that we lack. We are here as ambassadors, as a mission to save others. When you die, you're in glory. Like, that's a win for you. Right? Glorification. And you have the promise of it right now. Like, you have the assurance of it. You're seated in Him. There's nothing you have to do to get there. You have to prepare yourself to be glorified. You just will be. Right? It's not that if you don't prepare yourself before you die, then you will not be glorified. That's not the truth of God's grace today. So you see, the description is not the same with the church as it is for Israel. They have to prepare themselves to make themselves ready, or they don't get into that marriage. We're already in the body of Christ. We're just communicating to others so they also can be preaching salvation. So we preach the same love of God that He committed towards us while we were yet sinners. He died for us. But it's not that we're the city. It's not that we're waiting for marriage. Like a marriage that already has occurred, Christ is the husband, the head, and the body is, is, is the church. Right? Already happened. You're already one with Him. Yeah. Right? Praise and rejoice God in that. Yeah. Right? It's already occurred. Isaiah 62 then, in verse 7, he says, Keep not silence. The idea of praying. I Psalm 122 talks about pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? It talks about, throughout the scripture about praying for Israel, that sort of business. Why are we praying for Israel? Today we would pray for Israel to get saved by God's grace. That's what you should pray for. Pray for every Jew, everyone in Israel to be saved by the gospel, the grace of God. Right? Because if not, they're going to have a trouble situation here. Would you pray for the coming of the kingdom? You thank God that he's going to do it. But that's not what he's doing today. Right? I mean, if you prayed for God to keep his promise, that's what it's saying here. God, don't forget your promise. Right? Nothing wrong with praying the prayer as long as you know that it's not happening today. If you're praying the prayer, Lord, keep your promise as if you think it's going to happen soon, like today, then you're in the wrong dispensation. The prayer should be, how can we save these people by God's grace today? The motivation that I don't want Jews today to be saved by God's grace because they already have their kingdom and it hasn't come yet, that's kind of wrong. That's really wrong. Okay? Well, if they get saved by God's grace, they won't get their kingdom. They'll be saved. Amen. They'll be in glory. Yeah. Right? That's what this was promising. Okay? God is offering salvation to all today freely by His grace. The same Lord and Messiah, the same Jesus Christ, who's the head of the body. In Isaiah chapter 62, verse 7, Give him no rest, give the Lord no rest, in keeping not silent to, to pray and ask, till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. He's trying to make this engagement sure. He says, I have made this promise, this engagement, right? And do not lose hope, do not stop seeking it, do not stop looking for it, till it happens. Right? And this is why I said, maybe we ought not pray that, because we have something that God promised to them freely today. If we didn't have salvation offered to all men freely, then we would be praying for a future hope. Right? But we have something today that we can offer freely that you can possess. Isaiah 62, verse 8, The Lord hath sworn by His right hand and by the arm of His strength, Surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies, and the sons of the strangers shall not drink thy wine for he, the which thou hast labored. But they that gathered it shall eat it. So he says, give thy corn to thine enemies. This was actually a curse under the law. The law said if you broke the law, transgressed the commandments, then one of the curses was uh, the fruit of your labor, your enemies will eat. Right? There's nothing more frustrating than that. That the fruit of your labor, your enemies eat. One of the many reasons why socialism is unbiblical. Yeah. Okay? Because you don't know who's eating the fruit of your labor. Right? Now, if everyone's friends, then I guess that makes sense, but that's not the case in the real world. And so, through your labor, enemies start to take and use. Yeah. And that's a problem. It's why it's so frustrating when you're fighting a war, and you find out that your country's been funding the enemy the whole time. With well, whose tax dollars? I thought we were fighting for good. And now, apparently we were fighting for both sides. What's the point of that? That's a good question. What's the point of that? Follow the money. It goes out of your pocket to everybody else. Yeah. Right. 
But it's frustrating. And this was a curse of God on Israel. He said, he said to Israel, if you break my commandments, then I will have your enemies eat the fruit of your labor. It frustrates their, their growth. You're not singing Song of Solomon at that point. Come down in the garden and eat the fruits. You know, the fruits are gone. You work for them. Don't get to enjoy them. Right? Deuteronomy 28 speaks more about that. In verse uh, 9 then, They that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. So that's here. So that which is gathered, the fruit of their labor, they will drink it in the courts of my holiness. And so we talked before about how the nation will be a nation of priests, how the riches of the Gentiles will come in unto them, and so they'll gather it in that city and they'll eat of it. They won't pay taxes. Remember Jesus talked about taxes? He says, do the children of the kingdom pay the taxes? Now he was asking a prophetic question. The answer here was no. Now Jesus paid the taxes, but he made the point that, look, if the kingdom were here, we're not paying taxes to the Romans. Right? But he paid it, almost like evidence that we're not in the kingdom yet. Ding! <laughs> Pay to the Romans. Right? Thus Romans 13, Paul says the same thing. Give tribute to him, tribute is due. There's a whole other conversation about that. But, and so you have here, those who gather it now will eat it, and they praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it. Where are they drinking it? In the courts of my holiness. And so you remember Psalms talks about being in the courts People sing songs today from the Psalms, like, you know, a day in your courts. I want to be in your courts, and I want to... The courts of His holiness are the temple of God in the city. The people eating and drinking here is Israel in the court and temple of God, okay, that the Gentiles will be supplying. All right. This is speaking to them. The Gentiles don't get this promise. The Gentiles are seeking the Lord their righteousness, remember? And they're giving their riches to them. This is for Israel. Leviticus 6 describes the courts of holiness, the holy court, the holy place, the holy table where they're eating at. That's the priest. That's where the priests eat. Well, if the whole nation's a priests, then they're all eating. And the, what was reaped from the Gentiles, right? Verse 10 and 11 then. 10, 10, 11, and 12. This last section of Isaiah 62 deals with those entering into the gates, the holy people. He says, go through... Go through the gates, prepare you the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. This is the gathering. Remember we read so many prophecies before this marriage, there's a gathering, right? Before the, 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 the city and kingdom comes, they're gathering for all the countries. And so he says, get the, go through the gates, prepare you the way of the people. That sounds much like John the Baptist ministry in Isaiah 40. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Well, the Lord in this context is the bridegroom. John even identifies him in John 3. He says, he's the bridegroom, right? He has the bride, the bridegroom, that's him. So, you that have ears to hear, right? Oh, yeah, Isaiah 62, there's a bridegroom here. There's going to be a marriage happening. That must be the guy. He says, I'm going to go away and come back. Oh, okay. That sounds like Saul and Solomon. That's interesting. Isaiah 62, he said, prepare you the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. There's been many places, we won't go through them tonight, in Isaiah where the highway is built the highway of holiness, the highway of his people coming back to the, to the city. Take away the stones, gather out the stones so they don't trip over them. You'll take the stumbling blocks out of the way so the people can go back to the city. Uh, lift up a stand for the people. You don't want to get in the way of Israel getting back to the land. No. If you're in the way of Israel getting back to their city, well, <laughs> in a sense, yes, the Lord will clear you out of the way. Yes. Right? That's what's going to happen. So lift up a standard for the people. That's a sign. Right? Lift up a sign so that people will know it's time to bring them back. People will know it. And if they don't, they're not blessing Israel, and thus they don't get the benefits of that marriage, that glory, the righteousness that they can see. In Psalm 1-4, songs again are sung about entering His gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Enter His courts with praise. I remember the old hymn, right? Great tune. <laughs> Psalm 104 is talking about this. Enter whose gates? The gates of the city. What courts? The courts of the priests of the Lord. With thanksgiving in your heart. Why are you entering with thanksgiving? Because that's where the glory is at, man. That's where your righteousness is at. It's like, this good thing we're here because we could have been destroyed. Right? Or saved. Salvation's there in Zion. He'll establish salvation in Zion, His glory. In John 10, Jesus makes a big to-do about the door and making sure you get in the right way. Remember that? He says, I am the door. You have ears to hear. Apparently, getting in the right way on the highway and through the right gate, that's important business in the prophets because if you go the wrong way, you're not going to get in. 
Jesus says, I'm the door, I'm the way, right? So you can go study some of that. Verse 11 says, Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Jesus, the name Jesus, means salvation, right? He says, Declare to the nations, to tell Zion, to all the nations, to tell the daughters of Zion, right, that Jesus comes. These are people that are looking for Jesus, not people who are not looking for Jesus, right? So who's the remnant of Israel here, as Zephaniah says? These are people that believe Jesus are looking for the Messiah, like the known Messiah, not the unknown Messiah. First John talks about that. If people uh, believe that Jesus has already come in the flesh, they're the ones that get in. If they don't, they're Antichrist, yeah. as Jews are today, theologically speaking. They're like against Jesus coming in the flesh. He's not the Messiah. They don't think he's the Messiah. Right? He says, say to, say to the daughters of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Jesus comes. Hebrews 9 says this. It says, He came the first time to be a sacrifice for sins. He'll come again for salvation. Isaiah 62 says, Thy salvation cometh. Tell this to the daughters of Zion. Behold, his reward is with him, and his, um, uh, his work before him. And so his reward is this, right? The glory and the marriage and the feast and all that business. The work came before him. The work was what? The judgments and the cross. And he did the work here. You prepare for the marriage before the marriage. The marriage, you don't prepare anymore. You've already got yourself ready. You've already got the outfits. You've already got the priests. You've already got the situation and the place and the time. And, and now it's a good day, right? That's marriage. That's the wedding. All the work went before him. He did this to make that possible. He does the judgment to purify them. And so all that work went before him, but the reward he's coming with for those he's married to, for the city. Okay. So what should the bride do, I wonder? Look at Matthew chapter 25. As I tend to do at the end of my lessons lately. I will just give you a hint for more further study. There's so much in Isaiah back here. Matthew 25 is a very confusing parable for many people. And it ought not be as difficult as people make it. I'll say it, I'll just leave it at that. Um, it's, it's not easy, I understand that, but it's not... Uh, if, if you see that Isaiah 62 talking about this marriage and talking about Song of Solomon and make these connections, I, I see that it's a little simpler to describe who the ten virgins are. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So the bridegroom's coming, right? And we have some virgins that want to be with the bridegroom. So the virgins are waiting for the bridegroom, Right? And five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise virgins answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. What's the marriage? Boom. What's the door? Christ is. Right? They told him to go buy. Isaiah 55 says, get what you can't buy. He's talking about Jesus, right? Look at Song of Solomon chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. The very beginning of the Song of Solomon. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. This is a bride waiting for her bridegroom. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Your name is like ointment. What's ointment? Oil. That's why the virgins love you. It's your name. The Lord our righteousness, the city of righteousness, the perfection of beauty. All know all those names we study? Song of Solomon says, that's why the virgins love you, because of your name. Now, Song of Solomon doesn't ever give you the name. <laughs> right? It talks about virgins loving him and waiting for him coming. Matthew 25, Jesus says, there's some virgins waiting for the bridegroom. Some of them have oil, some of them don't. Like, they think they're going to get the oil later. Right? But some virgins have oil in their lamp. They're ready to go. And when they see the bridegroom coming, they get in. 
Didn't I just talk about there's going to be Israel that doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah? That's like them not having oil in their lamps. They're not getting in. But those whose name is as ointment poured over, that's why the virgins love you, right? His name, right? They'll bow down to him. Who? Him, Jesus, the bridegroom. They identified him. At 25, the five good virgins are the ones that identified who he is. They get in, right? So again, you see the marriage in Song of Solomon. You see it in Isaiah 62. You see it in Matthew 25. If you have ears to hear, right? I mean, you're making connections in Scripture here. So it's just something for you to study more out, I think. But Isaiah 62, verse 11 and 12. Verse 12 says, They shall call them the holy people. So a marriage happens, you get a new name. He called them Adam. What's the name of the city? It's no longer forsaken, no longer desolate. It's Beulah, it's Hezebah. I delight, the Lord delights in me. The land is married. They shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called, sought out, a city, not forsaken. It's a city that's getting married here. Revelation 20 and 21 talks about that, right? And so the holy people. Exodus chapter 19, God's promise to, to Israel was that they would be a holy nation, priests of the Lord, right? Psalm 107 uses the term redeemed of the Lord. The only other time that term is used in the Bible, the redeemed of the Lord, is in Psalm 107. It's not a coincidence that Psalm 107 speaks a lot about the Messiah and what Jesus does in his earthly ministry, even speaking about calming the waters and things like that. Okay? Identifying who this bridegroom is. Peter and John, you know, Paul never calls, there's a couple times where he, he's talking about your sanctified position, but James, or Peter and John use frequently this word holy to refer to people that are getting this kingdom. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, look what Peter says. To the remnant of Israel, is who Peter is writing to, the same remnant who will get that city and will get that kingdom. He says, 1 Peter 2, verse 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. We saw last week they were priests, right? Well, now they're a holy priesthood. Yeah, because they're the holy people. And by the way, that's what the Gentiles call them. That's not like an internal no, name, name given. It's like everybody else is calling them that because they see that they've been cleansed, purified. They're the beautiful bride. Right? 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse 9. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Right? This is the description of the bride. It's the remnant of Israel. In Revelation 20 verse 6. Revelation 20 is smack dab in the thousand year millennium that we're talking about, this marriage kingdom. And it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in that resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. They shall be priests of God. Can you be more clear what is happening here? Israel are the priests, Isaiah 61. They're holy, Isaiah 62. Right? A city not forsaken. Hebrews 13, 14, the audience of the book of Hebrews is Hebrews. And it says, we seek not a continuing city. We have not a continuing city. We seek one to come. We seek a city to come. That's what the, the, the audience of Hebrews is looking for. The audience of Hebrews is not you. Because the audience of Hebrews is looking for a city. The same city that was promised in Song of Solomon, Isaiah 62, by Jesus. And what will, will come down in Revelation 20 and 21. Comments? Questions? Questions?